Welcome back to lecture 17, part two, which would have been March 23rd. And let's get to it. So for this little mini lesson, this is the second of three. I'm going to talk about the two main energies of energy transfer in chemical systems. Uh, we're going to be introduced to the concept of specific heat capacity. You're going to be able to determine the work involved in a chemical process, at least in equation form. And using specific heat capacity, you're going to determine the energy needed to raise the temperature of an object. Energy exchange. All right. So systems and chemical systems, um, energy exchanges happen with their surroundings in basically two ways. Um, one is work is done, uh, work and heat. And work um, from a physics standpoint is defined as um, motion against a force or ex exerting or opposing a force across a certain distance. All right, so let's get the physics out of the way. Force is defined as the push or pull on an object. In equation form, it's the product of the mass of something times the acceleration that it is undergoing. So in unit speak, let's not forget that, um, it has the units of mass kilograms times the units of acceleration. And the units of the units of acceleration are generally length divided by time squared, meters per second squared, and SI units. So the SI units of force are kilogram meter per second squared. Now, as I said before, the work is defined as the product of the force and the distance over which it is either exerted or opposed. And so for the units of this, we would get, again, the units of force here times an additional distance. And that gives us kilograms times meters squared divided by seconds squared. And now the definition of energy is a very nebulous one. I mean, it is either the capacity to do work or to transfer heat, and as a result, energy and work actually have the same units. They're both unit. They're both a form of energy. So this would be also a kilogram per meter per second squared. And as I noted in the previous mini lecture, um, a one kilogram meter squared per second squared is equal to a joule, often denoted with a lower, uh, uppercase J. Going to talk about work first, as shown here. So the way that work is usually manifested in a chemical system is that the volume of a gas um, expands or contracts against a pressure. So imagine this open cylinder here where this top part can move up and down freely. And let's say that there is simply atmospheric pressure exerting on it. And something occurs that the gas expands and lifts the top of this piston. Now to do that, it's actually working against atmospheric pressure. So let's math this up a little bit here. You may recall from an earlier lesson that pressure is equal to the force um, exerted divided by the area over which, it, over which it is exerted. And so imagine this area here. And again, the height changes from HI to HF. So delta H is the amount by which the height changes. And the amount by which the volume changes is a function of the height and the area. It's actually the height times the area. So let's talk about what the magnitude of the work is. As we said before, the work is equal to the force um, times the distance over which it is exerted or um, pushed back on. Now, so this is equal to the force exerting here by the atmospheric pressure, for example, times the change in height. So remember that the you know, force is, if you rearrange this, you get force equals pressure times area. So let's substitute this into this equation right here. So then we get the work is equal to the product of the pressure, the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, and its change in height.
Now, the area, which is the cross-sectional area, which doesn't change, times the change in height is actually equal to the change in volume. So I'm going to substitute that into this equation right here. And that gives us the, the notion that the work is equal to the pressure times the overall change in volume of our piston here. And the one lesson we need to think about is what the signs are here, uh, which is why I said magnitude of work. And the convention is that um, all of these that we're talking about the energy of from the standpoint of the system. So think about this process. Um, our system is the gas in here. And at the beginning, initially, it's like this. And at the end, finally, it's like this. So what happened to the energy of the system? What do you think happened? So imagine if that was you in there and you were continually pushing up on that piston to increase its height, would that lower or increase your internal energy? Well, that would, hopefully you come to the conclusion that that would decrease your internal energy if you were exerting efforts to keep that thing up or to raise it. Now the problem is, so you'd want that process to result in a negative term for the work because your energy or the energy of our system in there went down. The problem is this expression as we have it here actually would give you a positive number, implying that if you did this, you increased your energy, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And this is because the volume change from the standpoint of the system was a positive quantity and pressure is always a positive quantity. So to keep with our convention that these changes in energies are always from the perspective of the system itself, we simply put in a negative sign. So the work involved in expansion against a constant pressure, which is the way things are, which is the way that one normally harnesses a chemical system for mechanical work, is simply the product of negative pressure times the change in volume. All right. So this is how um, chemical systems transfer energy by virtue of mechanical work, or an example of one way to do it. They're all pretty much like this. Heat, however, was a completely different story. Now it turns out that people had had hints of energy conservation for a very long time, except for heat. Heat was thought to be something very different than any other type of energy. And a lot of people spent a lot of time thinking about this for quite some time. And it wasn't until basically from early human history to about the early 1800s um, that people seemed to think that maybe heat was akin or equal as a form of energy, just like mechanical energy, gravitational energy, or something like that. Um, Benjamin Thompson, who was formerly referred to as Count Rumford, um, had said, made the statement that I'm satisfied that I shall live sufficiently long time to have the satisfaction of seeing caloric interred with phlogiston in the same tomb. And if you don't know what phlogiston is, Google it. It's fairly interesting. It is what people, it's sort of like anti-oxygen. People also spent a long time thinking about how things burn. And this was, people thought that burning was the transfer of this mysterious thing called phlogiston. And it turns out it was a reaction with oxygen. Um, in a similar fashion, heat was thought to be not some form of energy, but in many cases, an actual conserved fluid um, that was that moved um, from cold things to hot things, but it was still present in, in all substances. James Prescott Jewell of Jewell fame was the person that actually finally figured it out, and it took him a while. It was actually until the late 1800s. Um, that actually did the experiments that definitively proved that heat and mechanical work were truly interconvertible. 
And the reason why it took so long is because you had to do experiments very carefully. You have to you can put in a lot of mechanical energy into something and actually not get a whole lot of heat out of it. Um, and so his fairly painstaking experimental work um, laid the basis for sort of modern thermodynamics as it is now. All right. So heat chemical systems. Well, let's get the physics -y definition out of the way. Heat is referred to as non-mechanical energy transfer. Um, mechanical energy is organized motion. Heat is disorganized motion on the molecular scale. Now, um, we don't measure heat directly. Um, it is referenced by temperature difference. So in everyday English, heat and temperature are often used interconvertibly. In science, they are not. They are related, but they are not the same thing. Heat is a form of energy, has units of joules. It is often denoted by a lowercase q, um, but we determine its transfer by temperature changes because it's easy because, you know, thermometers. All right, some more vocabulary. So we have here our mythical system here, which is basically a big, big rectangle. Um, if heat goes into a system, that increases the energy of that system. So that heat is given to be a positive quantity. So Q is gonna be some number greater than zero. And heat, remember, it's not delta Q, it's just Q. Heat is actually, that letter Q is, has the transfer of the change actually built into it. Um, so the other way that this, uh, and the other way that systems can change we talked about is, you know, work, can be done to it or it can do work on the surroundings. So sign convention. So heat is added to the system. Um, its Q goes up, it is greater than zero. And the word we attach to that is endothermic. Um, now, if heat is added to the system, that means it has to come in from the surroundings. The surroundings actually get colder, which is where the endothermic comes in. Now, if heat is released by the system, then Q is actually a negative quantity. That heat goes out to the surroundings. The surroundings get warmer, and we call this process exothermic. And as a quick review, if work is done on the system, its energy goes up, so W is going to be a positive term. If the if the work um, is being done by the system, then its energy is going down and the work term is negative, so W is less than zero. All right. So what is the relationship between the heat transferred in a particular system, the heat given off or taken in, and the temperature change that you observe? And it's actually a pretty straightforward one. So, so far we're just talking about internal energy, so delta U, the change, and now if it is only coming from heat, um, we're saying that it's just gonna be Q and is equal to the mass. So it depends on a couple of things. One of them is how big the thing is, how massive it is. So you got mass in there. The other thing is the temperature change, delta T. And the other thing is this proportionality constant here, uppercase C, that is called the specific heat capacity. So we've got the change in energy, which is in this case for now, let's say it is only heat, no work done. And it's equal to the mass times the, times the heat capacity times the change in temperature. All right, so what is Let's talk about the process. Sorry about the germinal there. All right, um, so consider we know that if you take one gram of, of liquid water at let's say 14 and a half degrees Celsius, if you apply exactly 4.184 joules of heat, then the result will be one gram of water at 15.5 degrees Celsius. So get both of them up here. So what we're actually talking about here is a specific heat capacity. 
and that is simply the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of one substance by one degree Celsius, also by one Kelvin. There is another quantity called the heat capacity um, that is simply the amount of heat required to raise, um, raise the temperature of any particular object by one Kelvin. This is not used very often because it is different for each thing. And this is a more useful quantity because it's scaled to per unit mass of the thing. And so this is sort of a, a proportionality constant between the mass and the temperature change and how much energy it, it takes. And it is sort of a property of each individual thing. So how do we figure out what it is? Well, I'm going to go back here. So if you look back on the previous equation, so the specific heat capacity is simply the, you know, the way that you would measure it experimentally for something is that you would measure how much heat went into something divided by that thing's mass and the observed temperature change. In equation form, now this is merely a rearrangement of the equation from a couple of slides ago. The specific heat capacity, usually uppercase C, is equal to Q divided by M and delta T. And keep in mind that like uh, for any other things here, that delta T is simply equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So let's talk about the specific heat capacity of water based on the numbers that I gave you, which are not made up. Um, so I told you that it takes 4.184 uh, joules of energy to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And that gives us a heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Note the units, they are important and you need to keep them straight. Now, I would like to put that into perspective. This table here shows you the heat capacities of, uh, I guess, eight different things here in joules per gram. In this case, so I've got this in joules per gram per Kelvin. In this context, since the increment in Kelvins and degrees Celsius are the same thing. In both scales, there are 100 divisions between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. The joules per gram per Kelvin or joules per gram per degree Celsius are interconvertible. And what I want you to appreciate here is that water actually has a freakishly high um, heat capacity here. And it's higher than anything that is on this list and actually higher than most substances. So what does that mean? So if, if the heat capacity of something is, is large, what it means is that the absorption of heat of a specific amount of heat is going to result in a smaller temperature change. And just keep in mind, so to review what, we, what we've led up to here, the heat involved in any particular temperature change process is simply equal to the product of the mass of your sample times its specific heat capacity times the change in temperature delta T. So to give you a little practice on calculating these things. All right, so to give you a little practice with this, uh, let's determine the temperature change involved in these processes below and report which ex is expected to be greater. So process one, we're going to add a kilojoule of heat to 10 grams of water, heat capacity 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius, or the addition of half a kilojoule of heat to 20 grams of aluminum uh, with its heat capacity at 0.9 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So I'll let you hit pause and you can plug and chug the equation that we had on the previous slide and come up with their answer and hit play when you're done. Okay, you're done. So first process. So we're gonna rearrange the equation that we had for the you know, previous, uh, the previous slides. So delta T is gonna be equal to the heat divided by the mass times the heat capacity. Remember it's a kilojoule, so that's equal to 1000 joules, 10 grams. 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Note there is a joule component in the specific heat capacity, which is why we had to convert this to joules. Uh, so grams are going to cancel. Joules are going to cancel. 
the resulting unit is 1 over 1 over degrees Celsius, which is equal to 8 degrees Celsius. And the numbers turn out to be 23.9 degrees Celsius for the 10 grams of water. So we're going to add half as much heat to twice as much aluminum. Let's see what we get there. So now we've got 500 joules, it's 20 grams, but the heat capacity, note, is much, much smaller. And if you plug in that number, that is a 27.8 degrees Celsius rise. So because of this low heat capacity, we have half the heat, twice the aluminum, and still that's a greater change in temperature of 27.8 degrees Celsius. So that one wins. Okay, that is it for mini lecture number two. One more to go.